to go to a specific autistic school and start copying or mimicking the other autistic kids. She wanted me to copy the normal people or the MTs in love. So what does she do? She signs me up for a specialist school for dyslexic and dyslexic kids. Because they're normal. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the logic here. Um, seriously, though, I think that my mum's plan has worked because after 25 years of copying people who are normal, I can even convince myself I'm normal. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, it makes me think, though, I'm so good at copying normal people in life because I'm really good at drama. I'm really good at watching people and watching what they're doing and then copying them. But if I'm so good at copying my surroundings, what if I was a zookeeper? That's not <laughs> copying the monkeys. When I come home one day, dressed in a gorilla suit, and instead of answering questions, and my mum asks me what I want for supper, I jump on her shoulders, grab a banana out of her hand, and shove it on my head. <laughs> Now, back to a bit of seriousness. If you're diagnosed this late, there's only two ways I think you can take it. It is either complete bolt out of the blue or it all starts to make sense. Now, I know that I would the second one. I would think things like, that's why I don't fit in. That's why, if I start to agree with someone in a conversation, people think I'm arguing back and start arguing with me. That's why I make people laugh when I'm not trying to make them laugh. Obviously, I'm trying to make people laugh. Now. <laughs> I'm scared to die of laugh. So, and that's why the only thing on being that seems to understand me is my cat. And sometimes I don't even think but my cat understands. I said things like, my hand is not a chew toy. It takes one big bite out of it. I say things like, no, my face is not a pillow to sit on. <laughs> and that's not what it sound like in real life. It sounds something more like, <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'm talking about cats. Most people that know me know, but even before the diagnosis, I was known to be obsessed with cats. Now, when you've got a diagnosis, there's a special term for that. It's called a special interest. <laughs> but I, I, I like to think of it as an obsession. And I like to think that I take obsession, living with an obsession, with a whole new meaning. I mean, usually a special interest or obsession is celebs, cars, vehicles, a subject at school. But if you like cars, you don't go and sleep in your garage every night. And if you love Ferraris, you don't break in every night to the nearest Ferrari garage and sleep in one of the Ferraris. Mm -hmm. But I love cats. So what do I do? I live with cats. I think about cats. I spend money on cats. I spend time with cats. I dream about cats. I dream with cats. <laughs> it gets you thinking. I have spent so much time, money and effort on cats. If I could only choose my special interest, my obsession, I would think I could do something like make a career out of myself and just be really good at a normal job, or create about peace, or find love. I would have things like a Nobel Prize, or a, fa a, a husband and kids. I'll be rich and famous and wealthy. But no, I can't. So what do I have? I have three cats in my house of time. <laughs> I have a house full of cat stuff, and I don't just mean like cat bowls, cat food bowls. I mean cat stuff like cat magnets. <laughs> and you can imagine, being so obsessed, it's always in your head. So I've always described a way our thought processes work with conversation of our obsession, like water flowing to the lowest point by any means possible. I like to think it's a bit more like the dog from up. You know the one that he's talking about squirrels every five yes. minutes? <laughs> Hello, 
one. How are you, cat? What have you been up to, cat? He's in the house, it's like, oh, look, it's a cat. <laughs>
because on the basis where you would not find it. I couldn't find it. I would forget <laughs> where I put it and would search, search for over some time without finding it. So, and the other thing is, well, the thing I used to do with that was that, you know, the chocolate money you get at Christmas, right? I would sit up a bed at night and imagine them coming through the windows and me being able to give them the money and fool them. Now this although this had happened after I'd eaten chocolate money, I would save the wrappers and I would fold down the sides because that would be totally realistic. And in the first place I'd be brave enough to do that rather than running to my mummy and scream for help. So yes, I am completely bizarre. And as far as I'm concerned, so are you. <laughs> <laughs> Right, which is, which tells, me, tells you why I've written this in a comedy sketch. You either laugh and you, or you cry. And the reason why this is such an important phrase for me is because for me, the English humour has this great self-effacing humour, which gets us to look at ourselves and our bad bits and our foibles and our difficult bits and change them because laughter opens up the barriers and pulls down the, the the things, it stops you being defensive. So by laughing, you can understand me, or not, as the case may be. I mean, you're free to not understand me, guys. I don't understand myself. Remember? So, but either way, you now know who I am, and you now know about how I work, whether it makes sense or not. So I've got to go, because I've just seen a cat over there, and I really need to say hi to you! <laughs> Thank you.